Museums can, and often do, play a critical role in fostering interest, engagement, and appreciation for their locales. Naturalist Tom Wessels notes that if you want to be intimate with another person, you have to know their history. You have to know what shaped and molded them. It's the same with places. People are hardwired to need connection with their environment. When we get isolated from our place, it shows up in increasing rates of depression and anxiety. More to the point, connection to our environment, our towns, cities, and chosen places, is the essence of civic attachment, which is the basis of civic engagement, which is fundamental to successful democracy. Parents and teachers need to help children find ways to connect to their environment. It's one of the highest, best uses of museums, what they are often there for. Syndicated columnist Neil Pierce identifies soft factors like civic attachment as the root of economic development and a strong civic culture. People that care about a place, Pierce observes, spend more time and money, are more productive and more entrepreneurial. In a word, civic attachment promotes happiness. Happiness fosters teamwork, loyalty, and perseverance. What part of economic development doesn't depend on that? There are about 7,000 community-based historical organizations and house museums coast to coast, and that many more museums devoted to art, natural history, science, and special subjects, a veritable banquet of placemaking opportunity. My involvement with placemaking in museums dates back to the 1980s when I uh, organized uh, the 350th anniversary exhibition for the state of Connecticut, the Great River Art and Society of the Connecticut Valley, an exhibition that examined the history and material culture of uh, the western inland region of New England. The exhibition involved thousands of hours of field and archival research at probate court records, historical libraries and archives, and visiting more than 140 uh, small museums up and down the Connecticut Valley and as many private collections. Uh, we borrowed almost 500 objects from 90 lenders. It was a tour de force. The Great River was staged at the height of the decorative arts movement, and it focused primarily on early artifacts and material culture from before 1820, a facet of place, not the only facet of place, but a compelling one. Another exhibition that explored a, an important facet of place uh, during my uh, tenure as a curator at Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut, was Sam and Elizabeth's legend and legacy of Colt's empire, the story of uh, firearms impresario Sam Colt and his philanthropic visionary wife, Elizabeth, uh, who uh, left thousands of objects in the public domain. It was like really almost material culture personified a real platform for telling a story. Sam and Elizabeth Colt were larger than life. At the time of his death in 1862, he actually left the business and his estate to his widow, Elizabeth, who for the next 40 years uh, hired and fired presidents and uh, had a tremendous civic impact in Hartford, Connecticut. The exhibition, like the story, was unusual in that it combined art and industry. Uh, the Colt factory really was uh, one of the birthplaces of interchangeable parts and uh, machine-based manufacturing, an incubator of the what they call the second industrial revolution, the high-tech industrial revolution that really changed the world of work. At a time when most uh, New Englanders rarely traveled more than 100 or 200 miles from the place of their birth unless they were resettling somewhere, the Colts were international travelers. The business market was international, and the fruits of their internationalism, their globalism, were, are abundantly apparent in the collections they amassed. As the former director of the New Haven Museum, I had an opportunity to uh, run a community-based historical organization with uh, tremendous archives and collections. Founded in 1863, it's uh, the fifth largest repository of Connecticut uh, art objects and archives, and uh, one of the, I think, second or third oldest uh, museum in the state. One of the museum's most famous stories involves La Amistad, a schooner built and owned by a Spanish slave captain living in Cuba. In 1839, while it was transporting Mendy captives originally kidnapped in Sierra Leone, the Africans, led by Cinque, pictured here, took control of the ship. 
La Amistad was captured off the coast of Long Island. The Mendy were jailed while court proceedings grappled with their case. A widely publicized case, a court case in New Haven rallied and inspired abolitionists nationwide. In 1841, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Mende had been illegally transported and held as slaves and ordered them freed. While perhaps a little richer and deeper, the New Haven Museum's archives and manuscripts are suggestive of the kind of things that many community-based historical organizations contain, a rich field for research and civic knowledge. One of the outstanding research resources for community history are old newspapers. There's nothing more exciting than turning the pages and digging in to the stories of what was going on in a place in time. Like most community-based historical organizations, the New Haven Museum is a treasure trove for local uh, furniture and uh, decorative arts. Also, inventions and manufactured goods. New Haven was home to Eli Whitney, inventor of the cotton gin and one of the pioneers in machine-based manufacturing and interchangeable parts. The town also specialized in uh, manufacturing carriages and vehicles in the horse-drawn buggy era. New Haven is home to Yale University, founded in 1701. While the university has an amazing archive, the uh, New Haven Museum also has archival material and memorabilia related to Yale. New Haven has a rich ethnic heritage, and the museum is a treasure trove of archival material uh, related to uh, the various cultural groups that settled New Haven. While every community obviously has a history, many communities also have an art history. New Haven produced everything from textiles and furniture and silverware to uh, paintings and sculpture. Uh, it was actually a very important center of silver production. New Haven had a rare specialty niche in book publishing and map making as early as the 18th century. Amos Doolittle, a famous map maker and illustrator, and printmaker, also Thomas Kensett shown here. Especially before the era of photography, illustrators and artists captured a sense of place visually. Amos Doolittle, the map maker, was also uh, became famous because he rushed into print the first illustrations of the action at Concord Bridge during at the opening act of the American Revolution, shown here in the upper left. These are scenes, actual, historical, and mythological. Again, showing how artists capture a sense of place through their work. Uh, on the upper left is the famous story of the three judges in the judge's cave on West Rock. And the lower left is a work by George Dury, a famous illustrator of the New England scene, a New Haven-based artist. For two generations, David and his son John Ritter operated a monument shop on the edge of the New Haven uh, Canal that uh, connected the coast of Connecticut, Long Island Sound, with Northampton, Massachusetts. Their monument company uh, sold its products uh, all over the state of Connecticut and elsewhere. The mounting importance of photography and visual culture uh, makes the search for photographic collections in small museums a real uh, treasure hunt. Uh, these are some of the New Haven had dozens of phot photographers, and the New Haven Museum has almost 100,000 photographs taken before 1950 of the city. Sports, protests, ceremonies, daily life, the look of the streets, one could almost rebuild 19th century New Haven on the basis of the photographic evidence. It is amazing. Local industries are captured photographically and in artifacts. Who knew that uh, Long Island Sound at one point employed almost 50,000 people in the oyster industry. It was the center of that industry in the United States, and it is a colorful chapter of the city's past. From 1850 until the 1960s, New Haven had a booming industrial economy manufactured all kinds of things. Uh, as shown here are uh, rubber boots and shoes, and corsets and also components for uh, carriages and wagons. 
Museums can be extraordinary experiential learning environments where uh, students interact with uh, professional museum educators and learn something very few books and very few classrooms teach the story of their communities. Museums also provide ongoing place-based adult education, something uh, few institutions in our society are equipped to do. While New Haven's museum is a little larger and deeper than most, uh, the beauty of this is that communities across the country have local museums that tell local stories. This is Enfield, Connecticut, uh, home to uh, among its stories is that there was a Shaker community there. It was the center of the carpet industry. It was the center of the uh, gunpowder industry. Uh, the Historical Museum in Berlin, Connecticut is housed in the Old Town Library. Among other things, they also report the story of local industries, in this case, a decorative brick and terracotta, and also the manufacture of steel bridges. One of my favorite community-based historical societies in Connecticut is the Winchester Historical Society in the Solomon Rockwell House in Winstead, Connecticut. So many of these organizations, while preserving and presenting collections, also preserve amazing historic landmarks. This is one of the great federal period houses in the state of Connecticut. After the Civil War, veterans' organizations in the North, known as the Grand Army of the Republic chapters, uh, built collections in libraries and memorial halls in some cases. Eventually, some of those collections wound up, as they did here at the Winstead Historical Society, in the public domain and are a treasure trove for Civil War history. Souvenir China, handmade, homemade toys, and the products of local industry are uh, among the holdings of the collections of the uh, Winchester Historical. A high-tech installation is at the Mattituck Museum in Waterbury, Connecticut. It's titled Coming Home, Building Community in a Changing World, which has all kinds of, incorporates video and audio and, you know, uh, interactives and high-tech uh, displays. It's it's real state-of-the-art, but the beauty of it to me is that it what it does, you know, I call it a machine for manufacturing citizenship. It really is a almost an ideal kind of orientation to the story of a place, the story of a community, a uh, large immigrant community, a lot of people that are uh, struggling to kind of adjust to life in uh, a new country where English may be a second language, and this is like an almost perfect tool for helping people move that process along. Coming Home is a kind of high-tech, state-of-the-art exhibit that uses artifacts well, but also video interactives and uh, things that you can uh, manipulate and learn from. Like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Seneca Falls, New York is a small town that uh, is engraved in our consciousness forever because of a particular event that happened there. In this case, the 1848 Women's Rights Convention in which Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others uh, made really laid out the argument for uh, the women's the suffrage movement that finally culminated many years later. But, uh, you know, this is a local historical society plays a role in it. The National Park Service has a state-of-the-art exhibit there. It's a wonderful destination that tells a great story well. On a more modest scale, but no less interesting, we see Osawatomie, Kansas, uh, the place where John Brown... Uh, some will argue, launched the Civil War through the first uh, armed combat between abolitionists and uh, pro-slavery interests in 1856. This is the Orleans County Historical Society in Brownington, Vermont, a small town in which the uh, local uh, museum really interprets the whole central village, uh, turning it into a kind of uh, museum without walls. This historical society, housed in the famous uh, Orleans County uh, Grammar School run by African-American teacher Alexander Twilight is uh, great because every town in the county has its own room. These towns kind of jockey for position and sort of fine-tune their displays, a little bit of local pride and competition going on, tremendous variety 
all kinds of discoveries to be made in real platform again for civic learning. The Swift River Valley Historical Society in New Salem, Massachusetts is uh, the repository for the community memories and artifacts of the four uh, central Massachusetts towns that were taken by eminent domain back in the 1920s to build what is now the Quabbin Reservoir to supply water, water for uh, Boston. This is a bittersweet legacy in one sort of kind of rich in emotion and feeling, and it is an amazing museum with extraordinary treasures and a great story to tell. The Geneva, New York Historical Society, shown here, uh, how, is housed in an impressive uh, Greek Revival brick building with, again, varied collections. Love this children's room, a kind of education center. We're using maps and interactives to teach a sense of place. Maps are such a wonderful teaching device. Here is another uh, small historical society uh, that occupies a former town library building in Westbrook, Connecticut. The Westbrook Historical Society is on the coast of Long Island Sound and has a maritime history and uh, these paintings of uh, ship ships and stories of ship captains and this wonderful photographic collection they have uh, documenting a daily life in the turn of the century and uh, along the coast. Again, the kind of unique things that capture a sense of place and time. There's a subtle distinction between house museums and community-based historical societies that happen to be housed in a historic building. A house museum typically is about the occupant of the house. This one uh, was built by Oliver Phelps, who was a commissary in the American Revolution, one of the great Western land speculators in Ohio and the Genesee country. It was the largest uh, house practically in the state of Connecticut when it was finished in 1794 and um, is a, kind of a scrupulous restoration. The Longhouse in Ganogangan State Park in Victor, New York, documents and uh, portrays the life of the uh, Iroquois Indians, Five Nations of the Iroquois in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. And this is about as faithful a restoration of a life of the tribal Nate Woodland Indians as you'll ever see. Another kind of house museum is uh, shown here in the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in the New York City, which has really become famous because it pioneered the interpretation of uh, immigration immigrants kind of lower working class, something ethnic groups, something typically uh, traditionally not seen amongst the uh, house museums that uh, more typically portrayed the lives of uh, rich, white, early Americans. The Hadley Farm Museum is a specialty museum in a famously agrarian town with a 350-year agricultural history, chock-a-block full of extraordinary artifacts assembled by uh, kind of an antiquarian visionary named Clifton Johnson. Nothing high-tech about the presentation of the Farm Museum, but the uh, collections are fascinating and really thoughtfully arranged. Another specialty museum that tells a community story is the American Precision Museum in Windsor, Vermont, uh, home of the Robinson Lawrence uh, Firearms Factory built in the 1840s and housed in that building. It's one of the finest collections of machine tools and early technological process in the United States. It's well presented, lots of things to see and do, lots of interactives. It's a really great museum. Outdoor and Living History Museums is, is another genre, another way that uh, sense of place and community is preserved. Places like uh, Connor Prairie in Indiana, and Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, and uh, Plymouth Plantation also in Massachusetts, uh, Hancock Shaker Village. Uh, these are uh, whole settings in which uh, sense of place and history is preserved. This is one of my favorites, a little different. It's the Adirondack Museum, and it's a regional museum that, that, that captures, uh, preserves, and presents the history of the mountainous northern north country of New York State. It's a uh, multidimensional experience that combines art, natural history, history, and uh, topography and geography. It's really fascinating. Logging, wood products manufacturing, 
uh, summer uh, tourism, environmental issues, and uh, the advent of uh, canoe clubs and recreational boating. These are just some of the many themes taken up in the displays at the Adirondack Museum. The Adirondack Museum also has an outstanding collection of uh, fine art and an art gallery where the uh, paintings uh, from the early kind of Hudson River School era and genre pictures, historical maps and the early history of winter sports among many other topics are shown and illustrated. The Adirondack Museum also has a series of uh, historic buildings that have been moved from elsewhere rustic summer camps and this incredible uh, uh, a luxury uh, travel autom travel car from part of the railroad that was used by one of the Adirondack families. The Columbia River Maritime Center in Astoria, Oregon uh, is a museum of maritime life and the famous salmon runs and fishing industry. This was the center of the canned salmon industry for almost a century. One of my favorite regional museums is the Arkell Museum in Kanajahari, New York, in the Mohawk Valley region. It was founded by uh, the uh, president of Beech Nut uh, Baby Food and Gum, and uh, it was uh, had a lot of tie-ins to the company because the company used, it's, it was a food production company, and they used their sense of place and past in their marketing and advertising. It has a fabulous collection of American Impressionist art, but more to the point, really focuses on the story of its place effectively. One of the most fascinating explorations of place through art was an exhibition at the Arkell Museum drawn to the same place, the drawings of Rufus Greeter and Fritz Vogt, uh, two artists living in the late 19th century who used architecture and environment as a platform for exploring cultural identity in the Mohawk Valley region of New York State. Fritz Vogt was uh, more of a uh, architectural illustrator uh, in the forms that one sometimes sees in the atlases and uh, wall maps of that period, uh, but he really captured the nuance and detail of farm life amongst them, particularly the German farmers of that region. Rufus Greeter was something else entirely, an artist who used history, historic buildings, artifacts, and uh, local legends to, to create these sort of artistic tableaus that uh, are fascinating. Little essays almost on the cultural heritage of that region. Another outstanding regional museum is the uh, Monmouth County Historical Society in Freehold, New Jersey, uh, one of the areas uh, famous in the American Revolution. Again, they have a number of distinct local stories to tell. In the United States, there's nothing quite like the great Midwestern histor state historical societies. Here we are in Lincoln, Nebraska. And again, these institutions have immense gallery space deep collections, incredible archives, and a long tradition of a state-supported research scholarship and, and dissemination of historical knowledge. Here in Nebraska, we have the story of the corn huskers, the famous sod houses, an actual restoration of an interior from a sod house, and generally the story of the western settlement of the plains. As we move further west, the story of the Native Americans is more pronounced. The Sioux Indian on the Great Plains, an extraordinary collection, again, of artifacts at the Nebraska Historical Society. The Nebraska Historical Society tells the story of World War II through the kind of unique prism of Nebraska's experience. At the center of the country, it became uh, an important place for the internment of political prisoners. One of the oldest and most illustrious historical societies in the United States, the New York Historical Society in Manhattan, uh, which uh, pre predates actually the Metropolitan Museum of Art and has an outstanding collection of Hudson River School and American uh, paintings, uh, many new of New York's subject matter. What's great about the New York Historical Society is it's, it's 
adventuresome spirit. They uh, veer off into areas not traditionally treated, at least in much depth, by uh, local and state historical societies. Here we're looking at uh, excerpts from an exhibit on slavery, uh, a display about the Jewish heritage of New York, and uh, uh, an art display about the graffiti of uh, that used to cover the streetcars in uh, New York in the 1970s. The New York Historical Society has state-of-the-art storage, open storage facilities where you can really see probably most of what they have and own, and some of it, uh, you know, digitized with their interactive touch screen where you can uh, really you know, look things up and learn a lot about things that are not featured but are in storage. On the other side of the country is the Oakland Museum, across the bay from San Francisco, one of the uh, really the best history museums, regional history museums in the country. They pioneered the kind of modern, what we might now call state-of-the-art, multimedia, multidimensional thematic exhibitions, and still do it as well or better than anyone. The novelty and imagination of their exhibitions has to be seen, to be believed. Uh, and they again, they deal with a wide range of subject matter from civil rights and the black power movement in Oak Oakland, the, Black Panthers in the 1960s to uh, the 300 years of Hispanic heritage. And I, I love this in the upper left here, these uh, collection of shadow boxes, sort of biography in a, in a case where individuals uh, uh, donate objects that tell their own personal story. And then in the lower uh, left is um, work by one of what is known as the Society of Six, uh, the uh, California-based uh, kind of late impressionist from the 1920s and 30s. This is work by Selden Guile, and it's again a regional school of art that is uh, well portrayed in the collections here. Museological practices are not confined to museums. One of the great innovations of the uh, past uh, 30 or 40 years is the development of thematic trails. The uh, Freedom Trail in Boston was a pioneer. It started in 1963. It stretches from uh, King's Chapel and the Granary Cemeteries and uh, on, uh, just off of Beacon Hill all the way to the Bunker Hill Monument in Charleston and includes the Paul Revere House, Old North Church, and a great many treasures. This kind of linked site experience is a really effective way to convey a sense of past and place. The C.H. Nash Museum at the University of Memphis in Tennessee uh, interprets the uh, Chukalissa uh, archaeological site, Native American pottery from the, that part of the country. And again, it's sort of archaeology is a platform for interpreting history. Really well done and quite fascinating. Archaeology in ghost towns is kind of the story here. And uh, outside of Quebec City in the St. Lawrence uh, River, uh, Gros Seal was the gateway to Canada where immigrants from Ireland and other nations, their first port of entry in the New World, and uh, there's a heart-wrenching, tragic story of the Irish migration in the 1840s where I think almost half of them that died in transit or in from disease once they arrived in the New World. These are, this portrayal of hardship is uh, evocative in the extreme and is a kind of approach to history that uh, really uh, stirs people in its imaginations. AHA New Bedford stands for Art, History, and Architecture. It's a uh, first Thursday program in which, uh, again, the institutions and stakeholders in the cultural arts and heritage and restaurant communities uh, collaborate to really make the downtown experience a focal point for a uh, destination experience that is uh, unique and compelling. Museums of art, history, or science are, are never inevitably about place, but some reflect their places more effectively than others and embrace that aspect of mission more effectively than others. This is the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Quebec City, and uh, really almost everything on display here. They, they do occasionally mount loan shows that involve art from other places, but uh, most of what you're going to see there is art uh, from Quebec, and it is uh, a, a just a fascinating demonstration of the role that art plays in conveying 
a sense of cultural identity. Silver gilt statuary from some of the uh, Catholic parish churches uh, reflecting uh, the uh, religious heritage of Quebec uh, are uh, unique objects uh, that, again, convey a sense of uh, history. This exhibit at the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Quebec, uh, When Art Imagines History, is a collection of uh, history paintings that uh, report the story of the uh, Canadian Revolution, the formation of Canada, and some of the uh, legends in, of New France. Again, artifacts, material culture, all conveying a sense of place. The Witte Museum in San Antonio, Texas, is uh, one of the finest regional museums. I hesitate to call it an art museum because it does both art history and natural history, a nice uh, interdependent combination of uh, uh, artifacts and materials that really is perhaps the most effective way to teach sense of place. The Witte has an outstanding collection of regional art. The uh, picture of the prickly pear cactus flowers by uh, renowned Texas artist Julian Andudank. The uh, turn of the century Mexican chili stand by Clara Pancoast and the San Jose Mission from painted about 1849 by Seth Eastman. These are works of art that uh, remind us of where Texas came from and what its origins and cultural heritage was. Other localisms reflected in the displays are the uh, Zuni and Pueblo uh, pottery and baskets, the uh, early Texas uh, furniture, and a display about the Picos Indians and their use of peyote and other mind-altering drugs in their religious ceremonies. Art museums sometimes delve into regional subject matter. The Minneapolis Museum of Art organized art and life along the Mississippi River, which uh, explored uh, the century of uh, art, decorative arts, and economic uh, history in that river region in the Midwest. At the Concord Museum in Concord, Massachusetts, it was early spring, Henry Thoreau and Climate Change, an exhibition that uh, documents and examines uh, from Thoreau's notebooks really some of the uh, changes that have happened to our climate in 150 years since he scrupulously recorded what was going on in the natural world around Con. At the Bowdoin College Museum in Maine is an ex was an exhibition titled The River Lost and Found, the Androscoggin River in Time and Place. And it really was an environmental impact exhibition uh, using mostly photographs and oral history to, uh, you know, document and explore what happens to a place, a community, when its traditional economy, in this case paper making, uh, dries up and disappears. Tough times, difficult adjustments, fascinating uh, civic uh, curatorship. The Art Museum at Mount Holyoke College organized an exhibit titled Looking Beneath the Surface, the Quabbin and Hetch Hetchy Canyon that compared and contrasted the stories of two major land bodies that were taken by eminent do no domain to provide water for uh, San Francisco in the west and Boston in the east, their environmental impact, their cultural impact, using photographs, art, and memorabilia, an excellent approach to display and interpretation. Another museum exhibition project organized at a college was at Connecticut College in New London, uh, Connecticut. It was a class project, a seminar titled Col Commerce and Culture, Architecture and Society on New London State Street. And it really became an exercise in city planning, how to best turn around a historic commercial district that had lost some of its pizzazz and uh, you start by looking at what it was, uh, looking at where it is and projecting a, an idea, some ideas for the future. It was very well done and an interesting exercise again in placemaking. Some of the most fascinating community projects have involved artists working with museums and exploring aspects of place, community, politics. Uh, one of the most famous is Fred Wilson, who is mining the museum and the Maryland Historical Society, uh, really 
kind of established almost a whole genre for artists interacting with cultural resources in creative and compelling ways. He's done a number of site-specific projects since, and uh, Fred Wilson is somebody to look out for. He's fascinating. Talk about places that need intervention on the part of uh, art and history and cultural resources. Uh, Detroit uh, has lost literally half its population in the past half century. There are acres of abandoned buildings. Artist Tyreek Guyton, the founder and artistic director of the Heidelberg Project, uses art to provoke thought, promote discussion, inspire action, and heal communities. Uh, this is uh, one of the really fascinating artist-driven interventions anywhere in the United States. Museums of Natural History and Science, like the Peabody Museum at Yale University, uh, touch on a lot of subject matter, but uh, inevitably there's always a facet of the visitor experience that deals with the place. And uh, in this case, we're talking about Connecticut geology and natural history, and it's uh, quite well done there. To develop a strong sense of place, one needs to also study geology, earth science, and uh, and uh, natural history, and the Peabody Museum at Yale does a superb job of creating, using Connecticut as a platform for teaching those things. Connecticut, which itself is an Indian name, uh, was settled for almost 10,000 years by Native peoples before the Europeans arrived. Uh, various uh, lo locales around the state where different tribes are resided, uh, artifacts and archaeology help tell this story. The Peabody Museum has outstanding dioramas, uh, several of which uh, portray the ecology and uh, habitat of places within Connecticut, also display there of Connecticut shorebirds. Also in the state capital of Lincoln, Nebraska, is the University of Nebraska Museum of Natural History. Nebraska has been an archaeological gold mine for prehistoric elephants and uh, dinosaur bones. No state has a richer Native American heritage than Nebraska. Some of the famous place names there, like uh, Omaha and Wichita, are named for uh, tribes that uh, occupied the, the territory there, as did the uh, Pawnees, the Arapahoes, and Cheyennes. Uh, this is really not that far ago part of the heritage of Nebraska. There are still tribal reservations and native native presence in the, throughout the Plains region, and it's, a, again, an indispensable part of their heritage. What makes small community-based museums special is the quality of uh, passion that individuals bring to their local history and to their localities, whether professionals or volunteers. There are hundreds of thousands of individuals in this country who are ready to serve and to share and to teach and inspire. Interpretation is about storytelling, and storytelling takes many forms. There are first-person interpreters who convey a character from the past in costume. There are storytellers, the woman shown here in the upper left on the streets in Philadelphia. And there are just these local impresarios, people whose passion for place, it just radiates when you visit their museum they love to share their stories. They're, again, what it's largely about. As more of our time is spent at desks and behind screens in this homogenous global maze, isn't it refreshing to think that there are real things in real places that have an authentic local connection where we can you know, socialize and recreate and learn together? So let's wrap it up here with a look at the Windsor, Connecticut Historical Society, and let's talk about children, education, and our future. The late Ralph Elliott, a Connecticut attorney and the chair of the United States Constitution's Bicentennial Committee, wrote an article for the New York Times titled, It's Time to Teach Connecticut History Again. 
There he urged that Connecticut youngsters be afforded an opportunity to learn about the richly textured history of their state. He suggested using place, in this case Connecticut, as a readily comprehensible microcosm of the United States to teach how the nation was formed, grew, suffered, and prospered. How much more vividly the lessons of our country's past would come alive and be retained if they could be related to the people and places within easy access of our students. The sense of immediacy is of tremendous value in bringing home the lessons of the past, the effects of the past upon the present, and the continuing relevance of history at all levels in the life of us all. Wise words from Ralph Elliott. If I had a magic wand, rekindling that spirit along exactly the lines Elliott suggests would be the highest priority of our state and local education officials and politicians. This is what placemaking is about. This is what builds communities and ultimately makes stronger economies.